right here and, and burned in the engine because this will have an oil mist and smoke see if you can not a lot i mean but that is why it's tied to this got it it allows us come fumes coming out of here there's a little bit of pressure in here because of blow by pressure which isn't a lot and then this is under suction going back into the engine so it just suction oh. goes right back in there and burns it and so some of these are made where they go into the manifold there's all right. kind of different arrangements that's simple but it works fine so don't if you take this hose off or when it's you'll see smoke coming out of here not excessive and there is an oil mist sometimes so i don't have to freak out <laughs> if i see smoke <laughs> no it's right. not it's not like billowing smoke all right now cooling oh, this is a raw water engine so it's a very simple process <clears throat> this is a raw water pump mm -hmm. comes from the seacock right here right where that much the, i where is the strainer Okay, this is a fresh water pump. There is not a strainer on it. Okay, that's not good for the salt environment. I was looking for one because I knew there, there was supposed to be one. Okay, see that? Well, you got salt water is alive where fresh water is pretty bland. Yeah, okay. So if you get weeds and you should get a strainer and put on here. Yeah. You get seagrass, you get all kinds of stuff, and you don't want it. Yeah. Especially on this because it goes all the way through the block. It doesn't just go through the heat exchanger. You don't have a heat exchanger. Here. So it should be connected to this line, correct? It should be between Closer. this seacock right here. Yeah. Okay. Get a hose, run a hose. You can mount it. This is the muffler. You don't want to put a hole in it. Now, when I say a muffler, it's a water lock, yeah. water lift, mm -hmm. different. They call them muffler. Is that y'all knocking? Yeah, that was me. Okay. You need to put a strainer on there to catch any debris so it doesn't go through the engine. But whereabouts in in this line right here? See this seacock right here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. Okay. You turn it off. Take this piece out. Car keys. Put a hose barb in here, and I'd probably I mean, take a hose wherever you can mount a strainer. You want to keep it. Oh, so go from, from the seacock to the strainer, and from the strainer, strainer to the... Strainer back to this setup here where it goes into the engine. Now, this raw water cool engines, they have a little bypass system on them. Because unlike a freshwater cool engine where it's full of coolant all the time and circulated in a heat exchanger. When you first start this, the thermostat is closed, but it can't be completely closed. You have to circulate water because you have a water lift wet exhaust system. Okay? That's the hottest part of the engine. See how this is insulated right yeah, here? Yeah, this, is, this is dry up until a point where the water meets the exhaust. And this goes up behind there and there's a vented loop up here. This, this hose is going up into the cavity, probably behind the sink. Yeah. And the vented loop is a siphon That's break. You, might just you want to keep it as high as possible and as close to center line as possible because the healed water line, you want it always above the water line. So there's a purpose for why it's the way it is. Yeah, there's a purpose. It's <laughs> up behind it. there and as high as you can get it. Center line of the boat. Yeah. Always above the healed water line. Okay. Because the water line may be fine over here, but when the boat heals, this, you know, yeah. that's why the center line keeps saying So is this the uh, water this leaving storage. the engine? That's water leaving the engine, going up to that vented loop, coming back down, and it's going into an injection elbow right here. Okay? Okay. At that point, the water is injected into the gas, and it's now wet exhaust. Okay. Okay. This is a high maintenance item because of the environment it lives in. Yeah. Hot, corrosive, combustion gases, hot salt water. Yeah, it's about as bad as you can get. So those are items that go after a couple of thousand hours on an engine. So what condition do you think it's in? It's pretty. Uh, this has got a big dry exhaust on it, and this wrapping on here looks homemade. It is. You can go. You still have wrap with asbestos. Those days are gone. Thank God. You can go to a company called Fiberglass Coatings and you get two inch wide fiberglass cloth. 
and you just wrap it and wrap it and wrap it because this is a hot pipe. Ideally, you like to have this injection point as close to the engine as possible, but it has to be above the engine because when the water goes in, it's got to be going down. Okay. Okay, you, you can't let it come back into the engine. So that's why the injection point over here, and it's not a lot of, it's just kind of pretty damn near the level. The closer that is to the engine, the more prone you are to get what you call a hydrolock. That can happen because, say you have changed your fuel filter and you have air in the system, and you're attempting to start the engine, Yeah. and you're cranking it. And the diesel, then like a gas car, you can keep cranking on. Sometimes it'll start and go. If it's flooded or whatever, it doesn't happen. It doesn't apply here. If she won't start in a few turns, stop and find the platform. Because what happens if you crank it for more than two minutes? This water pump is still turning. It's pumping water. Not as fast as when the engine's running, but mm -hmm. at cranking speed, it's pumping water. Water's going through the system, and it's going to them going into it's that. It's going to water. fill it up. If that fills up with no, the only way that goes out is the exhaust pressure pushes it out. Pushes it out. It's a cyclic thing. Boom. Yeah. yeah. Foof, foof. No wonder. Yeah, foof. I've noticed that in the okay. back. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not constant. A, it's like on and off pushing right. through. As, as the water builds up, the pressure builds up. It reaches a point. Boom! It purges it out. Yeah. It's lifting the water up to get it above the water line. Otherwise, the sea would come back into your engine. That makes total sense, okay. Okay, that's why at this point, you want it as high as possible above the water line. You can put check valves and stuff, but they don't work well because of the exhaust environment. If you crank and crank and crank, you can fill your muffler up, it'll back up into here, it'll back up in the exhaust, go into the cylinder, and boom, she won't turn because it's full of water. It's hydrolock solid. <laughs> you can bend rods, you can, Not a good usually thing. it doesn't hurt anything. Then, most but people who do that. Most people wait, then they call a mechanic a couple weeks later, and then and so, we come out and so, they hydrolock the engines. So that's another <coughs> killer of engines. And then, it's, then it's, by that time, it's rusted shut. There's yeah. nothing you can do about it. Salt water in the engine, it's out a week. I got one right now. We're fixing to go pull the engine out of a little two cylinder Yanmar. So is uh, there another way to relieve that water out of there if it, if it floods? Turn the seacock off while you're cranking till, oh, you, till you resolve your starting issue. Yeah, yeah it, stop. Pumping water. Yeah, Stop prevention. Pumping First water. Step. And then when it starts, you got to immediately come down here and open it. Yeah, yeah. Because the impeller will heat up and burn up dry. It will yeah. take a little bit because there's water in there. But two minutes cranking. If she's not turning in a minute, stop and find a problem. And if you're gonna have to if you're still thinking you got air and you're trying to purge it, turn that water off. <clears throat> and once she fires, turn the water back on. As quickly as you can. It's not like a three seconds and the engine's gonna burn up. It'll no, run, right, right. It'll run ten minutes before it gets hot. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah, that, that's definitely good to know. Does that make sense? Yeah, because if I, I, you know, make sure I'm explaining myself. It's easy to to keep trying to crank it and. Yeah, hoping it's going to start. Yeah. That's the wrong approach. If it if it won't start, it won't nine start. out of ten times, if the diesel won't start, it's air in the fuel or no fuel. Okay, they're mechanically extremely reliable. As long as they've got what they need air coolant and fuel and enough juice from the battery and enough juice to carry it over for compression they'll go all right one of these this is a pretty good one some of these universals had bad mounts and they kept breaking the alternator mount this is a different setup you're in pretty good shape here it's good to see hey brandon brandon okay um, this is a thermostat here, okay, right here, now let me go back into the cooling system, since the engine's full of water, sitting there, yeah, it's the coolant, then you start the engine, you don't want to be pumping water just freely through the engine, it'll never heat up, you have a thermostat, same in your car, it's a dynamic process slowly opens and closes to whatever the design of the thermostat is to maintain a constant temperature. With the raw water cool you just can't shut the water off because you got to feed the exhaust or you'll burn your exhaust up. So there's a bypass system in here 
that allows water to go on into the exhaust, even if the thermostat's closed waiting for the engine to heat up. And the cooling capacity is more than the heat you generated. You always want to be on the positive side, so the thermostat will regulate it. You want your engine to run at a set temperature. Got it. Stable temperature is better. These just run cool. And the only downside of cool is they soot up more than the combustion process in this car. But this is a, a bypass system right here. You see this? Yeah, I see that hose. It's got fresh water coming right there. Right, and it bypasses the engine. And completely. some of it will flow back into there and just circulate back and forth when this thermostat's closed. And then it allows some water to come out here and constantly go and feed the exhaust. Because you can't interrupt this flow. Right. This flow has to stay going to keep the exhaust yeah. from burning up. Yeah. This flow, you want to circulate it, regulate it, open it, close it, whatever. And there's a thermostat right in there that does that. And that's in this device right here. See, how this can be a really good connection right here with all that rust. That's just a ground. Oh, it is. That's a ground connection. Yeah, what, a, corrosion what about that wire that's hanging out free there? I would think that wire needs to go right here. <laughs> that is a temperature sending unit. Okay, as is this. Okay. Temperature sending unit. Okay. Temperature sensor. Now, why? We have two here. <clears throat> the only reason you have two sometimes is if you have an idiot light and a buzzer. I don't know what you got in your panel. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there's one. That's temperature because it's in the cooling water. Yep. This is temperature because it's in the cooling water right here. Mm -hmm. Now, this water right here is coming out of here, going over into the exhaust manifold, keeping it cool. Okay. That Gets, keeps the heat from building in the cabin. And then that's going around and the water's exiting here, going up through your vented loop and out to your muffler, then it's discharged in that cyclic action of the board. <clears throat> okay? So you constantly, if you if you stop the flow, the first place it gets hot is here and here, because this is exhaust. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now the engine will still be cool, but that'll be starting heat building tremendously. Like you see now, you know what an exhaust manifold on the car is, you can't get near yeah. it. But you're not worried about that because you're out in an open environment. Here, you're trying to keep the heat out of here. Okay. So that's why the sensors are where they are. Yes, there's two there. I'm not sure this one. There may, one may be a buzzer, one may be a gauge. I don't know what you've got here on the back. Right. I don't know why they would. There <laughs> two of them doing the same thing. So right. It wouldn't be necessary. Now, there's an, also an oil pressure sensor, and it will be somewhere filters down here, it's usually down here in the neighborhood of the filter. Okay, go ahead. Hey, Brendan. Yeah. I need some batteries. On the front seat of the truck mm -hmm. is a little box of Duracell battery for the light. My light's starting to go. Okay. And it's got little individual four battery packets in it. Alright, is it what? Triple A's, double A's? Triple A's. Okay. It's only a little door. Then that pile of junk somewhere in the front seat. Alright, I'll <clears throat> Anyway, there's an oil pressure sensor somewhere down there. I don't know where it is. Let's see where it is. Usually right over in the neighborhood of the oil filter. There's oil gallon. Yeah. So there's one down there somewhere. For sending unit. Mm. Usually they're a little bit on the oil pressure. Unless you just got an idiot light. <coughs> Alright, now the transmission is where you can't check it right here. Is that where you check it? Yep, that's the dipstick and the fill. Oh, I see. I was looking for something like the oil filter. I mean, like the oil uh, dipstick. Dip that is the dipstick on the bottom of that. I see. And then we'll open that up and take a peek at it. And how yeah. often should that be <coughs> uh, replaced? $300. Change the oil every $100, which is a conservative. Yeah. And or annually, big in time transmission every third time keeps it fresh. There's no <coughs> the reason you change oil so often is because you got all the contaminants from the combustion process and carbon in there, and the lubricity of the oil starts going down. The transmission, there's no combustion in there, the, in the it lubricates fine, but you get some particulate from clutch wear mm -hmm. and bearing wear and gear wear, and you do that just to get that out of there. And clean it up. So you'll be able to tell if it needs replacement or not just from looking at it, or are we the fuel fluid? No, no, the uh, transmission. 
to it. Yeah, I'll listen to it too. These things are usually, unless they've been maladjusted, where it's not engaging fully. Now these are, they call, they're called crash box transmissions because there's clutch plates in them, but all they do is engage the process. Then the torque is actually what holds the load. It increases the torque. When you go to shift this, they clump. Okay, normal. People intuitively say, I want to ease it in the gear. That's not how they work. You want to sharply engage it. In or out. Okay, don't. And it clunks a little bit. That's by design. <clears throat> Some people want to ease it in. That's wearing the clutches five times as fast as Got it. engagement. Okay, they're designed to be in or out. No, no maybes. It's yes or no on it, both directions. So it's all push all the way in. As far as it'll go. Once it clicks, you can push more. Has no effect on anything. Okay. All it does is I have to sh show you the inside of the transmission, the way they work. But it's a very simple process. Lots of little parts in there. But when you go to shift it, don't don't mess with it. Put it forward. Now you don't want to shift it above about 850 RPM. Now some that's where they shift fine up to about 850 RPM. I don't know what your idle set out, it's probably around 700. But up to 850 is common on it. Now, if in an emergency situation or panic situation where you're docking sometimes, rum, 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 they'll take some of that, but it's, you're pushing it. Okay. You know, but shift it around, you pull the RPM back. In most situations, you have that. Now, if you're, like I say, if you're in a Cross current, you're struggling to get into the dock or whatever. You have to be a little more aggressive with it. You can do it. It's not going to fly apart on you. But you don't do it in regular operation above 850. Because it, it'll... It's pretty hard when you get up above the higher RPM. Yeah, I definitely don't want to do that. Well, you can... Like I say, it's not going to blow up on you. But you don't want to run it wide open and start going back forward and reverse. Because something, something will give. <laughs> There's a damper plate in there. But it only takes so much shock. Uh... What else I can really explain here? You it's not much more to it than that. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this has been very helpful. I really appreciate and, it. Yeah, let's. We need to start this beast up and let it warm up a little bit so we can change oil in it. All right. When you change the oil, let me let me check that transmission point.